Hey everyone, um, so there's some a couple of Total War Warhammer things to go over. Um, I'm going to be releasing these videos over the next couple days. Uh, we're going to be talking about things like rosters and um, some changes to the gameplay and a couple of announcements like putting miscasts in the game. Um, we'll be talking about the release schedule, some things we've seen in the game so far, all sorts of stuff. Um, it's been a while since I've talked about Total War Warhammer just because I've been busy um, with the lore videos, uh, which is fine because I talk about Total War Warhammer in those videos a lot. But there have been a couple of controversial things that have come out recently that a lot of people have weighed in on. Um, and normally I do not feel inclined to join in on kicking CA while they're down, so to speak. Um, personally, I tend to stand by most of CA's decisions. Um, but I have often been told that this is because I don't appreciate the gamer perspective. Um, I disagree with that. I just think I have a different one. Um, maybe it's not the most pure consumer friendly, um, perspective, but at the same time, I have my own motivations, um, such as having the best game I could possibly have, um, which doesn't always mean that it's going to jive, so to speak, with what everybody wants. Um, but I've grown very used to the idea of not getting everything that I want, especially when it comes to releases. I'm someone that tends to follow a lot of early access games um, and play a lot of smaller titles. I'm not really someone that you'll often see digging into AAA games all the time. Um, but let's get down to the meat of this video. So, something that happened a little while ago, maybe a month, uh, let's see, it's almost February, so yeah, it is February, so yeah, about a month ago, um, was that we got word about the regional occupation system, um, which I'm sure everyone has heard about, and if you haven't, um, I'm about to burst your little bubble, of that they have, CA has made the decision that instead of being able to conquer everything on the map, you can now only conquer um, racially appropriate enemies. And when I say that, um, they have decided to make it so that there are different classific classifications of uh, towns, essentially, um, and that you have human settlements, which is one category, which includes Bretonia, uh, the Empire, and the Vampire Counts. And you have the other system, which is the Holds, which... Uh, which consists of the dwarves and the greenskins. And what CA has decided is that only human settlement people can conquer other human settlement people and actually take over their stuff, um, and only hold people can do the same. So greenskins can only conquer dwarven territories. Um, they can do anything they want to a human territory except for conquer it. They can raise it, they can... Um, uh, they can raid it, they can, you know, they can sack it, whatever. But they cannot actually take over and start, like, building their own cities and stuff where the human settlement used to be. Uh, this has caused a pretty noisy uproar among a lot of communities. And any time that I have decided to speak with many colleagues, um, YouTubers and other Warhammer folks, it's been a arguing point almost every time I've shown up, which is fine. Um, but I figured it's about time for me to tell you guys my view without me having to, like, be dealing with some other person I'm talking to and having to, like, you know, argue from certain points. Um, I did a video where I talked somewhat about this subject with Arch, but like I said, the point of a debate is, in my opinion, is to have a good environment where you and your opponent can sort of just get out all the information you want to get out and have a good talk without getting too in, in each other's face and stuff. So I'm not able to just throw out what I'm thinking. It's got to be appropriate for the conversation I was having. So with it being just me, I can say everything I need to say. Um, so I'm going to address this from three major points. Um, the first of these is from a lore perspective, is this accurate? Um, if you go on to a lot of different channels, and I mean a lot, um, from Arch Warhammer to Warrior of Sparta to Sun Jetsu to all these guys, there's, there's a lot of them. And a lot of 
these guys are amazing, hardcore, or hardworking people that I have the utmost respect for, um, especially uh, my colleague uh, Arch Warhammer. Um, but at the same time, I don't agree with their synopsis about is this lore appropriate. If you go check out most of these channels, they will tell you no, it is not lore appropriate. Um, and a lot of them won't give you any examples of how it's not lore appropriate. They just say it is and want you to take their word for it. Um, and I think a lot of people allowed their out, a lot of people who know Warhammer lore allowed their outrage at this decision to influence how the Warhammer world actually works. And so they came out saying, no, CA is just making excuses. You actually, in the lore, this happens all the time. Well, okay, let's get down to the real meat of it. No, it doesn't. There are six factions that I'm worried about right now in Total War Warhammer. That is Warriors of Chaos, Bretonia, Empire, Vampire Counts, Greenskins, and Dwarves. So I'm just going to work my day, work my way down the list and tell you why the regional occupation system is canonically appropriate. Uh, we will get into whether it should be done later on in this video. But for right now, I'm just going to focus on, does this make sense in the lore? And the short answer is yes. Um, allow me to explain myself. Let's start with the Empire, which has been probably one of the more majoring arguing points for a lot of people. Uh, them and the Greenskins. But we're going to start with the Empire. So... The Empire occupies a notable portion of the map, and later on in this video, when we talk a little bit more about it from a gameplay perspective, I'll put up the map that shows, like, human settlements versus holds. Um, so, a lot of people have seemed to believe and been strongly arguing that it makes no sense that the Empire cannot conquer uh, Norska, and it makes no sense that the humans cannot conquer the Badlands, and it makes no sense that the humans cannot count, uh, conquer human or Dwarven Karax. So let's address these one at a time. First is Norska. A lot of people have been very upset that Norska is an unconquerable zone, but at the same time, if you go watch my Norska video, for instance, you should find pretty quickly that there's a good reason, lore-wise, uh, we're not getting into gameplay, just lore, um why that is an appropriate decision. Norska, at the end of the day, is a completely inhospitable continent. The only reason the Norskins lived there is because a long time ago, they got the crap kicked out of them over and over and over by tribes coming north, um, whether that be the Tutigans or the Ungols, or it was a mess, and they were just getting whipped. Um, and they got pushed all the way up to Norska. They didn't grow up in Norska. They've tolerated living there, but they have a pure raid society. There are no farms in Norska. Virtually none. Um, all the food that they can get is mostly hunt-based, but not everything, and actually very little, of what exists in Norska is normal. Um... If you watch the Norska video, even the southern half of Norska deals with some pretty serious issues caused by chaos being so close. There are monuments to various chaos lords that are active, there are demons prowling the lands, there are terrifying monsters that roam about, there are all sorts of crazy things. There are, you know, snakes that can that turn into a bird and fly in a moment or moments. Change is on the air, and chaos is right there. When a chaos invasion starts, something a lot of people don't understand about chaos is they think that the words of chaos just come south and that's all it is, is that it's a big invasion and that's what's scary. That's not why it's so scary. What's scary about chaos is that when chaos starts to expand, the actual realm of chaos starts expanding and eating everything beneath it. And this means that this is why the dwarven holds that were like at the level of Norska, not Krakadrak, the ones a little bit north. Krakadrak has managed to stay up for some different reasons. Um, but like uh, Kalak Vlag, all of these holds collapsed because the realm of chaos expanded far enough south where it literally just ate them off the map. Um, Krakadrak, I don't want to get too into because it spoils a video I have coming up very soon, um, like in the next week, so we'll get to that. Uh, that's a minor exception we're going to talk about. And a lot of these will have a single instance of exceptions, because it's a fantasy universe and that happens. 
Um, but Norska is not hospitable by humans, normal humans, southern humans. Norskins are much bigger, they are much tougher, they worship the Chaos Gods, which kind of gives them the tolerance to live there, and they're constantly raiding the Empire. A lot of people seem to be under this idea that if the Empire were to unify, like it is in Warhammer Fantasy, and they were to march north, like they did in Warhammer Fantasy, that they would be able to beat the Norskins, like they mostly did in Warhammer Fantasy, and then conquer Norska, which they could not in Warhammer Fantasy. And the reason is, the land is horrendously inhospitable, and it is impossible to build lasting settlements. The Norskins who have been there for thousands of years have managed at best to make small fishing villages, but most of these have to move on a regular basis because the land is constantly changing, it's constantly shifting, the terrain doesn't even remain the same, there are some plains in the center, but to get those you have to get over the mountains, which is almost impossible, unless you have a special kind of horse, which even if you got in there requires you to go up against the horse tribes, who the only way they survive is by constantly hunting gigantic monsters and using them for food, which... Although, yes, that provides a good form of sustenance, it's not exactly wholesome, as those things are rife with mutation. Warpstone dust is everywhere in Norska. You cannot live in Norska and not have mutations in your life. You cannot live in Norska and not have madness in your life. You cannot live in Norska and have not have change and chaos be an intrinsic part of life. You would have to literally... You would have a better chance invading that eastern portion of the chaos waste and pushing the mountains further up north and trying to take those lands than you would conquering Norska. When people look at it, they tend to think, okay, it's an icy realm that's got some barbarians on it. Humans can, we can do that. Humans in our world can do that. Why can't these guys do that? You have to understand that chaos is a literal piece of that land. You cannot separate Norska from chaos. No matter how strong you are, no matter how unified you've made the Empire, in the Warhammer world, chaos is always present, and it's always winning, in a kind of distorted sense of it's almost impossible to get chaos to back down. So, is Norska habitable? No, not by any moderately good-thinking civilization. So let's talk about the one exception, Krakadrak. Krakadrak was a series of holds known as the Norskan Dwarves. Um, Krakadrak is obviously the final one. Um, there used to be about six to seven holds that were up there that were functioning quite well. Most of them are all gone now. Um, Krakadrak has held on by the skin of their, well, I guess the thread of their beard um, through some miraculous acts that I'll be talking about fairly soon. And for them, it is a horrible slog of battle. And they are not winning. They live within their holds, and they face chaos invasions on an insanely regular basis, and if it weren't for the fact that their hold is virtually impenetrable to outside attack, that whole Krakadrak would, be, would have been destroyed. And in 8th edition, the Warriors of Chaos book actually had it so that all the Norsekin dwarves were wiped out. Krakadrak was destroyed by a warlord of the Isling clan. Um or try it, rather, um, long, long time ago. Um, a different book in 8th edition decided to retcon that through some different events and actually had it where they actually managed to survive and recovered, but they ain't, they're not conquering anything. <laughs> they're not uh, going to war regularly with the Norskins and claiming huge swaths of land or doing crazy things. No, it is a daily struggle for survival. And these are dwarves in a Karak that's fully functioning and has not been terribly damaged by Skaven or Orcs or worse. And these guys are barely hanging in there. So what I'm trying to make clear is how not possible it is for humans to take that. Not the humans of the Warhammer world. Maybe people of our world, with our more sophisticated technology or the way our advancements work, maybe we would have a chance of taking a Norska equivalent, but Chaos don't play that way. 
And if you don't allow mutants as a part of your society, like the Empire does, and for good reason, you don't like chaos cultists as a part of your society, you don't like chaos as a religion, you don't uh, regularly take these monsters and use them as actual battle mounts, but instead are terrified of them slaughtering your women and children, you're not going to live in Norska. You're not going to be able to do it. Um, having a military base there would take such an absurd amount of resources, such an absurd amount of effort, and for zero gain. You would literally be making no gain whatsoever. You would never make gain. There is nothing that can be done to Norska to make it farmable. There is nothing that can be done to make it pleasant. Uh, at best, you can harvest some of the trees and try and set up some sort of trade routes like the southern tribes can. Um, but the southern tribes have also had thousands of years to adapt to the living uh, environments of Norska. And they've also managed, they're warlike enough, and they reproduce fast enough that they can handle fighting off the northern tribes, at least until a chaos invasion picks up. The only reason the southern tribes have survived and managed to trade with some other parts of the world is because, quite frankly, they have enough of a good relationship with chaos that chaos tolerates their existence there. Any time, though, that the Empire has made an attempt to conquer Norska, the backhanded slap they get from Chaos immediately afterwards is absurd. Um, a good example is Karl Franz, during his reign, left, led an invasion of Norska. It was moderately successful. They did a lot of damage to the southern tribes. Uh, one of these tribes was wiped out by the uh, Count of, I believe it was Ostland. And the payback was that a terrifyingly powerful Chaos Lord gathered up a huge army, descended south, completely burned all of Ostland to the ground, and sacked and utterly obliterated the capital. The Elector Count lost both of his sons, if I recall correctly, and the only reason he survived is because he was away at the time. Um, but after his son was m basically murdered by the Chaos Lord, the Chaos Lord decided, okay, we're even now, and killed himself, essentially. Uh, that's a story for another time. But, um, it, chaos is without end, chaos is without limit, chaos is without number. It is a force that cannot be defeated, it can only be stopped for temporary p parts of time. The Empire, the Dwarves, Bretonia, nobody in the Warhammer world has the ability to single-handedly take chaos down, even in a sandbox Total War environment. If the Empire were to somehow conquer the entire map of this first game and were able to put all of those resources to use, they would still need probably a couple hundred years worth of population increase to have a hope of going to war against Chaos and it being a fair fight. But the moment you encroach on Chaos's territory, the amount of mutations and madness you have to deal with, it's impossible. It is downright impossible, at least for humans. There is... Evidence suggesting there are some races that could defeat Chaos. The Empire is not one of them. So, okay, so we got Norska off the list. Let's now talk about uh, Dwarven Karaks. So, a lot of people have asked, um, and Arch brought this up when I spoke with him, about, well, why can't humans just take Dwarf Holds? You know, why can't humans go into Dwarf Holds and just make them accessible and make that work? So, let's talk about that a bit. Um, the first thing to note about a Dwarven Karak is that these are immense strongholds that are built entirely underground. Um, a lot of them are also going to mountains and go up, but you're still underneath tons and tons and tons and tons of rock the entire time. In the Warhammer world, it's well established through very, 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 very many books in the lore that humans are very uncomfortable in human Karaks. They're very claustrophobic. They're very dark, they're very scary, and you have all this rock above you at all times, and it's an anxiety-filled nightmare. Uh, dwarves see much better than us, they are much more stoic than us, they have much more stamina than us. Um, what do these things mean? A, dwarves do not, dwarves have good lighting systems, but to properly defend a Karak, you have to have people down in the mines at all times. And these can't just be little rotations of 20 guards. These have to be people who are in head... The only way the dwarves manage it is by putting iron breakers, which iron breakers are clad head-to-toe in gromerol armor, which is essentially impenetrable. And even they struggle more than you can imagine to hold the deeps. 
most dwarven holds go miles underground. And they are so stupidly huge that even the great meeting hall of uh, Kalazakarak can fit most of Altdorf in it. This entire city, the capital of Altdorf, the largest man-made city in the entire world, can fit inside a part of the largest dwarf in Karak. Well, the second largest. Karak 8 Beaks is technically larger. The, the amount of time it would take for humans to take a Karak, let's go through all the steps that would be necessary. If humans wanted to take a Karak, first, you have to get the dwarves out, which is a absolute nightmare to exterminate all of them. That means you have to break open Runeforged doors, which are nearly impossible to break, which you might, which you can do until World Warhammer, as it is, because you can actually uh, sack and raise these holds. But you have to force your way into the hold. Then you have to go through about 20 deeps worth of levels that are all insanely huge, trying to find and purge out all of the Dawi, unless you want to try and enslave them. But historically, in the Warhammer world, the Empire has never been terribly fond of slavery for good reason, and the dwarves do not make good slaves. Uh, only the most cruel of races, like the Skaven and the Dark Elves, have any success at breaking the dwarves to their will. And even then, dwarves are very fond of slave rebellions, and their rebellions are mean. Uh, second, once you purge out all the dwarves, if you could, if you wanted to claim all the treasure and resources that you would need to actually make the hold functioning and make it worth the price of trying to, I guess, redress it, you would need to find all the runically sealed doors where they keep all their heirlooms, where they keep the forges, where they keep all that stuff. But here's the problem. Dwarves, when they're under siege and realize that they're going to lose a hold, they will runically seal every single one of these doors. Now, we're not talking about a door that's got, like, a bar behind it. We're talking about a door that has runic seals on it that are so powerful and so well designed, the door is invisible. It just looks like a part of the wall, and only dwarves can tell the difference. And even if you could find it, it takes an exceptional amount of ingenuity or magical might to shatter the runic wards on it. The likelihood of finding all of these doors, much less getting them open, is hilariously small. The only reason the Skaven and the Greenskins are able to do it is because A, they always take Karaks by surprise 9 times out of 10 when they win an invasion, and B, they're there for thousands of years, just multiple generations, and these runes wear off eventually. But as humans, you don't have that time, because now we come to problem number 3, which is that Karaks are always under attack. There are no exceptions to that rule. Greenskins are endless, Night Goblins are endless, Skaven are endless. They never stop coming, not to mention worse things. Humans do not have the infrastructure, do not have the soldiers, do not have the equipment, do not have the skill that would require them to sit down deep, deep, deep in dark, terrifying mines for weeks on end without any help, without any additional food, and dealing with the likes of gutter runners, rat ogres, uh, night goblin fanatics, squigs, Humans are not physically capable of pulling that off. And we're not even talking about human needs such as vitamin D, uh, better levels of oxygen, more uh, better requirements of food and sustenance. Dwarves literally can thrive off beer. Period. If dwarves have beer, they will be fine. They can actually live off of it. It counts as their food and their water, and they will be okay. Humans don't play that way. Humans actually need... a like a decent mix of supplies. Humans need sunlight. Humans need to not constantly be in tunnels that are about four to five feet tall. Humans need enough room to actually utilize their best equipment, their giant war machines, their cavalry, all of these things that are so important for humans to use. If you try and put a human in full plate armor, full plate armor like a Niner Breaker is, and stuff him down into one of these holes and say, okay, I need you to hold off a couple thousand Skaven until we can send some reinforcements in about a week. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I don't care how good your empire is, the humans in the Warhammer world are not physically capable of that. It's too heavy, it's too much, it's too cramped, there's too many enemies, they can't see well enough in the dark, their equipment's not good enough, they're dead. So... 
let's assume assume that you've conquered the entire map. The Empire has conquered the entire old world and has turned to the Dwarven Codex last. So that maybe you're saying to yourself, okay, well, I will solve this problem by eradicating the Greenskins. Uh, it's a sandbox game. If I conquer the entirety of the Badlands, which you can't, because uh, we'll get into that in a minute, and if I were to magically curtail all of the Greenskin hordes, and the Skaven aren't in this game, so I don't have to worry about that, uh, okay, now I'll take the Dwarven Codex. Well, now we've got some more issues we have to talk about. First, nothing in the Dwarven Karak is going to be very usable by Hugh. All engineers are jealous in the lore. Many of them hide their workshops. Actually, all of them hide their workshops. They're very difficult to get into, and they are booby-trapped with terrifying traps. If you try to get into them, a lot of people are going to die. And even if you do get into them... There's also this little issue that human engineers are not nearly as skilled, nearly as adept, or nearly as intelligent as dwarven engineers. Although they're more, uh, shall we say, experimental and willing to come up with more uh, dangerous machines that do more damage but are more likely to not work properly... Saying, trying to take over Karak and saying, okay, well, since we're humans, we're just going to use everything the dwarves had in here. Unfortunately, that's probably not going to work very well. First of all, most runic weapons do not respond terribly well to humans, if you can find them. If you can find them, they have to be maintained. Well, too bad. You wiped out the dwarves, you now have no runesmiths. You cannot maintain runic weapons, you cannot make any more runic weapons. If, the scave, if an enemy manages to break one of your walls or something goes wrong in your hold, you have no way to reinforce. You have no way to protect. You have no way to, re, to heal any of your issues. You are essentially in a giant pit waiting to die. If the entire empire moved into a tiny hold, and I mean a mining settlement, it would be a very terrifying, difficult, and trying ordeal with many, many resources at stake to turn that dwarven mining settlement into something that could function as a human fortress. Uh, good examples that actually exist in the lore of humans having the ability to occupy prior dwarf things but not because it was too hard was Middenheim. The city of Middenheim, the city of the White Wolf, um, which is in Midland and is the capital, is built on this gigantic mountain, basically. And this mountain has tons and tons of holes going through it, catacombed. Uh, it once had a dwarf hold underneath it. Um, most, if not all, of those dwarves are now dead, or have at least moved up into the city and the hold was abandoned. Um, and yet, the humans never were able to repurpose anything below them. Why? Because it's impossible. Because <laughs> the humans can't make it down there. They can't sustain themselves down there. You get lost. It's dark. There are horrible things that live down there. Skaven ended up conquering the entire lower parts of Mindheim because the humans were completely incapable of it. The humans had about a thousand years, roughly, of free time after uh, the Black Plague was thwarted by Mandred Skaven Slayer to conquer... The whole, the Warrens and the abandoned hold beneath the Mindenheim, but they couldn't because it was physically impossible. When you want humans to take over a dwarven Karak, you have to understand this is not the same thing as if I took the city of Dallas in Texas and just put a dome over it. It's nothing like that. It's like if I took the city of Dallas, expanded it by about. 10 times, except for I went vertically, and then I had it constantly under assault by the worst nightmares you could possibly imagine. And it was built for a race that had better eyesight than us, was shorter than us, was stronger than us, and requires less sleep, less food. It's just, it's so, it's so out of the realm of possibility, it makes my head hurt. Which is something a lot of people have struggled with. A lot of people see dwarves and they say, well, they're just short humans. No, 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 no. Dwarves are a completely alien race to humanity in the Warhammer universe. They were forged from rock by the old ones. They were literally made of the stone itself and designed to work with it, live within it, and shape it to their will. Humans were not made even remotely like that. Humans have no natural affinity with stone or rock. 
Every technological advancement the humans have made in the Warhammer world was because the dwarves gave it to them. <laughs> There's maybe a few minor exceptions, but almost even if we go back as far as Nehekara or uh, the beginning of the Empire or even Bretonia, most of their greatest war machines, most of their greatest cities were built by dwarves because the humans are just not capable of it. The Nehekarans might be a uh, exception to this rule, but the Nehekarans were also monsters compared to humans. They were immensely tall, immensely strong, and they were almost they you could almost consider them perfect beings um, compared to regular humans. And even they ended up falling due to their own hubris and some other idiotic decisions they made. But at the end of the day, the humans in the Warhammer world are not half as resourceful as people like to think they are. They're very numerous, they're very open to trying anything that comes to them, but at the end of the day, all of their greatest strengths are things that were given to them that they then repurposed. The dwarves taught them engineering and technology, the elves taught them magic. They have... Hmm, even many of their battle strategies have been stolen from other races, other nations. The Empire, Bretonia, and we'll get to the Vampire Counts in a minute would not be capable of repurposing a Kadak. They are not capable of it. I'm not even saying that they don't want to do it. I'm saying that they cannot. Even if Karl Franz said, I'm going to take over the old world, and then I'm going to lay siege to Kadak's Kadak, and I'm going to conquer it, and we're going to do everything we can to conquer it, it would cost you the entirety of the Empire. Because the amount of resources you would have to put into it for zero gain would be so traumatically awful and you cannot stop the greenskins, and you cannot stop chaos. And meanwhile, while you're trying to take over one dwarf hole, the rest will rally and come after you like hell hath no fury. You would be surrounded, and you would die. At least, and once again, these are lore perspectives. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are going to come in here and say, but sandbox, but sandbox. I'm not talking about that yet. We'll get to that. Finally, the Badlands. Why can't humans take the Badlands, you ask? Well, quite simply, it plays into the whole thing we discussed before. And there are no resources in the Badlands. There are zero resources in the Badlands. It is literally a absolute wasteland of nothing but dirt and dust and gross and swamps. It's awful. There are a couple of mountains, but that plays into the whole thing, which we've already talked about. Um, there are a couple of orc settlements, but orcs don't need any of those things. Orcs can just sustain themselves on eating each other, and there's enough of them that they can get away with it, and they reproduce at levels humanity can never even hope to match. The border princes, those were that the border princes were essentially a nation founded by Bretonia when Bretonia basically waged a huge war pushing their way to the southeast. Bretonia tried to conquer the Badlands, and the Border Princes was the best they could do. They literally put everything they had into it, and the bad thing about Orcs is if you keep beating them, beating them, beating them, beating them, and start cramming them all into one area, they start to build up really fast, and they start to get unified really fast, and when a wah comes after you, have fun. The Border Princes have managed to hold out for a really long time because they're giant castles. The Border Princes are essentially a good example of humanity's best effort at colonizing something they had no business colonizing. The Border Princes were a moderate success at best. Um, but even they really struggle to hold back the tides of greenskins. But to go south of the Borderlands, there's nothing for you to conquer. <laughs> there's nothing for you to own that would provide any helpfulness to your empire, would not provide any good trade, there's no one out there to trade with, would not provide any good alliance, there's nothing but orcs out there, would not provide, um, I mean, there's some dwarf holds, but, I mean, the be it's better to trade with them through the mountains, it's safer, and honestly, a better trip. So, um, really, even in a sandbox environment, there would be no reason to conquer the Badlands, especially when you cannot take the holds because of what we already discussed. Okay. Man, this is going to be a long video. That's enough about the Empire. 
Let's talk about the vampire counts. Why can't the vampire counts take Kadox, you say? Neferata was able to take a Kadok. Why can't Manfred von Karstein take a Kadok, you say? Well, okay. Let's talk about Neferata. Neferata, whatever. Neferata, she is the one case in all of the Warhammer World's history where a non-Skaven, non-Orc has taken a Kadok. Now, first of all, there is a slight issue with her story. And what it revolves around is that we do not know who she took the Kadok from. Um, there are two different stories. One, if you read the Neferata novel, um, goes over that she took the hold from a city of dwarves. If you read uh, previous army, uh, army edition books, it says that she took the hold from Greenskins. And if you read the modern Vampire Count book, it merely says she took a dwarf city. Um, whether that means that it was built by dwarves or that it was occupied by dwarves, we don't know. Um, personally, I tend to run with the narrative that uh, Neferata took it from the dwarves, um, just because I've, we've actually got a story detailing it that makes it more interesting. But it's we, we don't know who she took the Silver Pinnacle from. Now, let's get to the real meat of Neferata, which is, did she take the Silver Pinnacle? Yes. Is it a functioning Karak in any way, shape, or form? No. What Neferata did when she took the Silver Pinnacle was that she went up to the very upper echelons of the peak, where there are these glorious windows that look out on the mountains, because that's ultimately why she took it, is that she really liked the view. Um... And she repurposed the upper, like, two or three levels. Um, she has really one giant chamber that she has filled with stuff that basically are Nehekaran and aesthetic to sort of create, recreate the th throne room she used to have in Lamia. Beyond that, there is nothing in that hold. It is literally abandoned. All of the lower deeps are not functioning. The mines are not working. The, uh, the, um, having a brain fart. The forges are cold. There's no farming. There's no food. There's no industry. Neferata doesn't do anything to the Silver Pinnacle. She just lives there. She repurposed the aesthetic to make it all pretty at the top levels, invited a bunch of vampires to join her. She has, and she keeps a bunch of thralls so that she has constant access to eating people. The rest of the hold is literally a cold, dark, horrible hell of an abyss that is just full of corpses walking around constantly. Everyone who dies in the Silver Pinnacle, she basically hurls their corpse into a chute, essentially, and deposits them all deep, deep, deep within the hold, so that there's this huge undead army just roaming around. But, this is not a functioning hold. There's nothing special about it. There's no industry in it. She's not gaining any resources from it. It's a place where she hides. And when she came out and decided to wage war, she brought all of her undead out of the Silver Pinnacle, and at the end of the day, it wasn't really that big of an army. When she mustered all of her forces in the end times and marched out of the Silver Pinnacle with every single undead that she had, it was a paltry force compared to what the likes of Manfred von Karstein mobilize. She marched this force and took it down into the mountains fairly close to Kadok Azul, and she almost got wiped out by a greenskin army that was fleeing from... It wasn't like a gigantic, unstoppable greenskin horde. It was a bunch of random tribes that a goblin decided to briefly take over, and Neferetta... Neferata would have lost if it had not been for Krell. And then she fought an expedition force sent by the dwarves. Once again, she would have died if not for Krell. Neferata is not what you... When you say, I want Manfred to occupy a dwarf hold, what Neferata did to a dwarf hold is not occupying it. She did not conquer it and start rebuilding it and produce units from it and all this stuff. She killed everyone inside, raised their corpses, and hid there away from the rest of the world. And she is the only example of that ever happening. 
other than that, why else? Why would a vampire count be interested in taking a dwarven kadok? At the end of the day, they're not. Vampires do not care about riches. Vampires do not care about gold. Vampires do. Uh, they're immortal beings that care only about the power of magic. They care about finding the tomes, the books of Nagash. They care about finding magical artifacts of immense power. They care about finding really powerful crypts. Dwarf holds are basically the exact opposite of everything they want. They are dark, crammed places full of dwarves, which vampires cannot turn. They can make them into zombies, but that's it. They can't make higher level undead out of them. Dwarves runically seal all of their burial mounds, so it takes a tremendous amount of effort to break even one of them open to try and resurrect a couple of zombies. Because all of these dwarves are zombies, you can't actually get them to use any of their former skills for the sake of wielding powerful runic weapons or building fortifications or anything like that. Zombies, that's, all, that's, that's the best you get. You can use them as puppets to be your front line and uh, hope that their dead bodies are a little bit tougher than your normal zombies. But dwarves are very difficult to res. They're naturally resistant to magic, and that stays true while they're dead. Vampire counts have zero to gain from a Karak. It is not good for them. They're not interested in rune magic. They're not interested in dwarven riches. They're not interested in dwarven weapons or shields or armor. And, and many runes have anti-undead properties or anti-destruction, I should say, written into them that make them burn things like vampires and chaos warlords and the like. Vampires do not like to squat in holds. There's the reason vampires... Vampires have laid sieges to holds before, and uh, very few of them have been even remotely successful. But at the end of the day, vampire accounts prefer to, f to take over very magically saturated areas, and they want human dead. Vampire accounts value the dead of humanity more than any other race in the world, because it's their... The, the dead of humanity is what vampire counts function best with. Can vampire counts raise the corpses of elves or dwarves? Yes. Can they raise them as anything higher functioning than a zombie? No. If they want proper skeletons, if they want anything that isn't basically a lumbering servant that groans annoyingly, you, you need to do better than dwarves. You have to have humans. You want whites, you need ancient burial tombs of humans. So, for the vampire counts, taking over a Karak is completely impractical. They Once again, they don't have the magic to reinforce it. They suffer from a lot of the problems the humans do, um, but even more additionally, that holds are designed to be very anti-magic. They're designed to siphon the winds of magic out of the air. They're designed to repel the undead, and the vampire counts can't use anything in there. The vampire counts don't use money to buy their hordes. I mean, they are going to have a treasury system, sure, but it's probably going to be a little bit different functioning than most would think. But vampire guys don't pay each other in gold. Gold is fairly meaningless to them. They're immortal beings. Magic. Power. Those are what matter. Blood, even. Humans. Cattle. They can't feed off dwarves. They can't resurrect dwarves. They can't feed or resurrect off greenskins. Both of those races taste absolutely disgusting to them. They do it in an absolute desperate time only measure. Um, and of course, same goes for the Badlands. Greenskin corpses are not optimal, they're not the best. Human corpses are the best and optimal. The only thing vampire counts would be interested in doing in human to dwarves and greenskins is just to wipe them out so that they're not a problem. Just to murder them. And conquering Kadoks or holds and conquering orc settlements is not really the best way to attain to that. Um, it's better to raise them and continue on your journey to conquering the human world, to become the vampire, or you know, the first undead emperor, the first vampire emperor, and things of that nature. Uh, once again, I know it's been like 15 minutes since I said this, but we are talking about things from a lore perspective. There is always the argument that in a sandbox situation, you could, you know, when people say like Superman versus Batman. They say, but I'm going to sandbox the narrative that Superman has no problems with killing. You know, and obviously that changes things. Um, we are talking about this from a lore perspective, not from a pure sandbox. Well, my vampire account wants to live underground because that's what, because he, you know, 
He likes to have a pickaxe and wear a digger hat, and he likes to be dirty. No, we're not. We're not doing that. We're just doing lore. So let's move on to the dwarves. Why would the dwarves not want to take human settlements? This one's actually very simple and very easy. They are vastly inferior. The dwarves have had many grudges to settle with the Empire and Bretonia and the Norskins for many, many years. And if it's not a mountain, the dwarves have zero interest in living with it. They can't fortify it to the levels that dwarves find acceptable. Dwarves hate being underneath the open sky if they don't have to. When they go after a human city, they just blow the living crap out of it. When they fought the elves during the War of Vengeance, the, el the dwarves did not occupy a single elven settlement. They just obliterated all of them. Because dwarves don't have an interest in taking inferior races' horrible excuse for architecture and defense and structures. Dwarves just want to reclaim their empire, which there is a lot of it to reclaim. And even if they were to make new holds, which the dwarves really don't have the technology to do anymore, at least not very well, um, they would do it in the mountains. Dwarves are mountain folk. They do not like living in the plains. They do not like living anywhere else. There used to be a subset of dwarves called, uh, that were essentially the plains dwarves. The dwarves had a rather ugly name for them in um, uh, Kazalid. But all of them were wiped out during the War of Vengeance, and the dwarves took that by, you know, the High Elves and their dragons and their cavalry, and the dwarves took that as a very notable, a very logical sign of, we shouldn't do this, living out in the plains got us murdered, we should just stay in our holes where nobody can get to us, and those are dwarves. Alright, so, on to the second to last group, which a lot of people have wondered and worried about, are the Greenskins. Let's talk about the orcs. So... The Greenskins are one that people find head-scratch worthy of why they cannot take human settlements. Um, I've heard many, many times people saying, why can't my orcs take over Altdorf? Why can't I take over um, Quinnells? Why can't I, why can't I, why can't I? So let's talk about orcs and goblins. Orcs and goblins are not a civilized race. So what does that mean? Well, orcs and goblins are a race that burn, loot, and pillage everything in their path. There is one exception, however, and that are those are dwarf karaks. Not for lack of trying, but because it's impossible. The reason that orcs, goblins, and their entire miserable little race is able to take over or decide to occupy dwarf karaks is because they're underground, they provide enough room for all of the greenskins, and they are so durable that even in the greenskins, you know, washing over them in a wave of an orgy of destruction, the greenskins cannot destroy them. So they just kind of start living there. The same cannot be said for Altdorf. Altdorf is made of walls and buildings, and guess what two things are not going to survive a successful greenskin invasion? When Altdorf is flattened, it's essentially a giant pile of rubble and wood and blood and guts. And what do greenskins do in giant piles of rubble, blood, and guts? They build lots of orgies to Gork and Mork, burn some stuff, eat some stuff, and move on. Orcs do not like to stay anywhere. They do not like to sit around. They do not like to occupy things for very long. Dwarf holds, however, occupy a special place in greenskin hearts because greenskins are a naturally underground dwelling race. Uh, although in the Badlands we have many tribes like the Savage Orcs um, who uh, like to sort of roam the open air, Savage Orcs are also batshit crazy. And they, yes, they do wander around, but once again, they don't settle. They're migra migratory. They don't have any consistent notable settlements. When we look at greenskin maps... We essentially have what are called orc camps that are designated by tribe, like the Red Moon tribe or the, uh, you know, things of that nature. And these, uh, the Yellow Fang tribe, whatever. Um, these orcs and goblins do not settle in the sunlight. They settle in mountains. They settle in super gigantic, creepy, dark forests. And they settle extremely deep underground, which makes up your orcs, your forest goblins, and your night goblins. Most of their orcs rampage around the Badlands constantly. So you might say to yourself, well, why can't I repurpose Altdorf? Well, 
That's because there would be no Altdorf. <laughs> you cannot rebuild... Orcs do not build from nothing. Orcs build from what survives. When they swarm over a dwarf hold, they take it over, they pillage and loot everything in into the satisfaction of Gork and Mork, they remake everything in there into their god's idol, which, funny enough, actually works well enough that they can make an industry out of it. Human settlements get bowled over. Vampire Count Castles get bowled over. They're, there's nothing left. There's nothing to make industry from. There's nothing to... Uh, there's nothing that inclimates naturally to the orc and goblin lifestyle. Orcs and goblins, to talk more physiologically about them, their spores tend to prefer and grow in dark, damp places. Very, very rarely... Are there any orcs that are raised in a dry, dusty, sunlit environment? Although the Badlands is full of orcs, it is probably very easily suggested that not many orcs are actually born in the Badlands, but that's where a lot of orcs come. Um, of course, the Badlands are full of crags and mountains and deep places in the earth. Um, there's Once we talk about the Badlands in the regional videos... Um, which I believe the next one coming up is Kislev. The orcs and goblins, the Badlands is a cracked wasteland that has many, many deep places, many deep caves. It has a whole series of its own mountains. It has a minor sections of mountains where the mines of Ekrand were stashed. And it has a lot of dark, gloomy, terrible places deep beneath the earth where orcs thrive. The world's edge mountains, lots of places where orcs thrive. The forests, lots of deep, dark places where goblins thrive. Lustria, deep, dark places where goblins thrive. Nagaroth, deep, dark places where orcs thrive. Southlands, deep, dark places where orcs thrive. Whether it's jungles or forests or mountains or caves, orcs will thrive. Now, where is one place that's very bright and wonderful and doesn't have access to many of these things? Ulthuan. Are there any orcs in Ulthuan? No, there are no orcs in Ulthuan. Which is surprising, because Grom did have a successful invasion of Ulthuan, and was able to sack Yerversi before um, Eltharion the Grim was able to show up and kill him, well, not kill him, but kill his shaman and force the orcs out. Any other place in the world, the orcs would have successfully still managed to lay down some spores during that war, but they didn't, because Ulthuan did not have an environment suitable to orcs and goblins. Therefore... Great for them. There's no orcs and goblins on Ulthuan. So, last but not least, is Chaos. Chaos is very straightforward. Chaos don't build. They don't build. Best case scenario, they would like to do a ritual where they transform the environment into a hellscape, and if a champion dies, they'll build a pillar in his honor, though usually it transports in through magical ritualistic means. Spoiler, you can already do that in Total War Warhammer. If you get enough chaos corruption in an area, you are able to turn it into a horrible landscape and it changes on the map and it looks amazingly awesome. So, that is all of the races. Bretonia, just sub in everything I said for the Empire. Um, obviously, I personally hope that this system doesn't necessarily stick through the remaining games because it's going to get super complicated once you throw in, like, elves. Um... <sighs> okay, so the next big, big, big point, um, sorry, I hope you guys are sticking with me, I know I'm rambling a bit, is from a gameplay perspective, do I personally think this is a good idea? Now, I am not saying that I want this to be your opinion, I'm not saying you should support my opinion, I'm just letting you know what I think, because if you've watched this far, apparently you care, and good for you, you're awesome. I personally think this is an awesome decision. Now, why do I think that? Well, I've played a lot of Total War, um, almost all of it on Total War uh, Shogun 2, I must admit. Um, and I have always hated mid to late game in a Total War game because it's so agonizing. Because since you can c conquer everything, you have to literally go every direction at once. And you have to hold off every enemy at once, but you also have to keep taking things. And you end up expanding to have such a massive empire, and it's so it's such a slog through the mud. You're just auto-resolving everything you can possibly click. 
And at the end of the day, I agree with CA that makes me feel like that's not. I'm not playing the game at that point anymore. I'm just trying to get the stupid achievement for winning the campaign. I mean, and that's not even trying to take over the whole map. That's just winning a long campaign. I've beaten one long campaign in my... Uh, actually, three. I've beaten three long campaigns in my entire life um, in Shogun, uh, Shogun 2. And those were long experiences. Now, a lot of people, and I say a lot, very loud people on the internet have said, well, this is a decision that's core to Total War and everyone does it. Let's be real here. If you go to Google and you look up Steam achievements for Rome 2 and Attila, you will see that a hilariously small percentage of people who have bought and played these games have ever complete, successfully completed a campaign. There's not even an achievement for conquering the entire map, but if there was, it would probably be astronomically small. Because, like, Rome 2, I believe uh, Rome, which is the highest faction, had an achievement rate of, like, let's say it was, like, somewhere between 6 and 8%. And I think Rome 2 sold about 2 million copies, if I remember right. That is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the player market. Attila sold, I think, more in the ballpark of 200,000 copies. And it was even, the percentage was even worse. It was even tinier. There are a lot of people who I've talked to, in, especially in recent days, who've said over and over and over that they feel like their ability to have a sandbox game should be respected. And that there should be a checkbox that they should be able to tick saying, I want to conquer the entire map. And I should be allowed to do that. I, as a gamer, cannot agree with this philosophy. Because as a gamer, it is always in the gamer's interest to have as many options as humanly possible. That's a fact. But as a Warhammer player, I disagree to the highest level humanly possible. And I am in full support of this decision. And as someone who will be playing this game, I think it is the best decision C has ever made. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, I am the lore master of Warhammer. I know a lot of lore about Warhammer. There's probably nothing on Earth I know more about. And there are very few people, if many, that know more about Warhammer than I do. And as such, I put the lore matters to me more than I can express because it's so rich and full and amazing. What people don't understand is that when you go and you tell players, okay, you're going to play the Empire, and you can conquer anything you want. Good luck, have fun. You're taking away from Warhammer and making it a total war game that has been painted over with Warhammer. And that is not what CA has expressed that this game is meant to be, and it's not what I personally want this game to be. You, you can disagree with that, and I fully respect your opinion, and you're an awesome person, and I love you. But at the end of the day, this video is about why I'm supporting this decision. And I love this decision because it's going to show you Warhammer the way Warhammer was intended to be shown. This is going to be a perfect, amazing game set in the Warhammer universe in every way it deserves to be. It's not, oh, I can play Warhammer, but I can also just play Total War that kind of looks different and has some monsters in it. That's not what this game is. Um, and I'm not saying that would be a terrible thing. I'm just stating a fact. That's not what it is. And I hate to burst your bubbles, but CA is not going to change this before release. Maybe on the second game, they'll decide, you know what, we didn't like this. And we're going to just make it so you can conquer everyone. And that would be great. Everybody would win. Awesome. Um, but I honestly think that for the first game, I think it's a good experiment. I think it's an okay way to shake things up. I think it's an okay way to make the campaign more interesting. You know, a lot of people say, well, this will limit my decision. I don't know how you've seen how big this freaking map is, or if you've seen the dwarf um, campaign maps they put out today or uh, uh, on February the 3rd, or the vampire count, like I'm showing up here. This map is huge, and it looks like it is a horrible bitch to conquer. Pardon my French. 
it looks like it is not going is going to be a huge challenge to maintain a reasonably sized empire because you're going to have enemies coming at you from all directions and that is the core of Warhammer. This isn't even all about I should be able to take a dwarf Karak because I want to. It's about giving you the real Warhammer experience and that in Warhammer there is no safety. There is no way to stop the tides of chaos. There is endless amounts of greenskins. The fact that if I play the Empire, I've got to try and conquer almost the, like, at least half of the old world, which is a huge amount. I mean, just look at this map. That's a massive amount of space. I need to conquer all that while making absolutely sure that I'm constantly defending myself from the greenskins, that I'm constantly defending myself from chaos, and that I'm dealing with any potential issues with the dwarves. I have to make sure to either keep them happy or if I'm going to fight them to watch out because they're everywhere. You're not going to have a safe border that you can just throw yourself into. Um, like when I played Shogun 2, I remember playing the Hojo clan and I was able to win even on the hardest difficulty because I could just turtle. And the computer just couldn't get to me. It seems like Total War Warhammer, that's not going to be an option you're going to easily have. It's not going to be easy to completely take over a side of the map and then be able to defend it with an iron wall. It seems like you're really going to have to be very tactically aware. You're going to have to be careful scouting. You're going to have, you're going to, have to have armies patrolling your borders, scouting for the enemy, sacking, you know, raising Norska, raising the dwarves, raising the orcs to try and keep them under your heel, try and keep them from getting too big, try and limit how often a WA or a chaos invasion can come down. I think that is a brilliant mechanic, and I mean brilliant. I love it. But at the end of the day, I understand that for a small group of people, and maybe you're bigger than I think you are, but I honestly think you're small, I'm sorry, that are just very loud, that this is a restriction they don't want. I'm so sorry. I really am. It sucks. It sucks that you don't get a choice. I really wish it was a tick box that you could either, like, it, it was like, it said lore friendly. You could just click it and, or, you know, and whatever. Um, I have heard some goofy arguments. A lot of them I've had to think on quite a bit over the, uh, the past few weeks. You know, I had someone tell me, well, this isn't a total war game. I disagree with that because you can still declare war on anybody you want, so I don't think that's remotely true. You just can't take over their stuff. If anything, it's more of an actual total war game because the war never stops. The war never stops. You can't conquer the entire world. You can't end the war because it's not possible because this is Warhammer. It sucks. Welcome to a dark and terrible realm. Um, the third big thing uh, I've heard some people worry about is if this restricts the choice of the player. And when a lot of people say that, they tend to say that in the terms of, well, now if I play the Empire, or if I play uh, Greenskins, I can only go north through the mountains. And that's my only choice, and it sucks. I disagree. Because I think, looking at this map, that you're going to actually have a bunch of options every time. Are you going to go into the mountains and try and conquer some dwarven holds early on the game? Are you going to try and unite the Badlands? Are you going to try and force your way through the Border Princes so you can get to the Grey Mountains first instead? Are you going to try and force your way all the way north so that you can start fighting chaos and dealing with them and get your law meter really high? Um, I think there are a bunch of different ways that this game is actually going to be playable with each faction. Um, honestly, I have much more of a problem with the... Um, all the legendary lords starting in the same spot than I do with any of this stuff. But I do not think at all that this is really going to restrict your ability to have multiple playthroughs of this game, considering we have four races that each have two, or excuse me, five races, um, probably six, because Bretonia is probably going to come out very, very quickly. And with just the five we have, we already have a legend, 11 legendary lords that are going to offer a different gameplay experience based on which legendary lord you take. You cannot look me in the face, proverbial face, because you can't see my face, and tell me, well, this game feels too restrictive, I'm only going to get like 15 gameplay hours out of it. No, you're going to get more like 500 gameplay hours out of it, unless you like rush, but even then I think this game's going to punish people for rushing. So, 
At the end of the day, I cannot change how you feel. I'm not here to change how you feel. I wasn't even trying to change your opinion. I was merely trying to present how I feel about the situation, and I was trying to present the lore situation on this issue. This is a perfect representation of Warhammer Fantasy from a lore perspective. You cannot conquer the world in Warhammer. You cannot. The only beings that were ever capable of doing such a feat were the likes of Nagash, Archeon the Everchosen, uh, except for he burns the world instead of... But, well, you can play as him, and you can do that, but you have to do it the Chaos way, which is burning everything to the ground, so Archeon's still 100% lore-friendly. Uh, but there is no race that was capable of that, and there is no race that would ever be capable of that. Uh, you know, especially since this game doesn't move forward in time, you can't just wait 2,000 years, or 500 years, or whatever it is, to try and build up your empire, or your dwarven, or the Kara's Ankor, enough that you can then take over everything else. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Um, from a Warhammer perspective. From our world's perspective, taking over everything makes perfect sense. From a Warhammer perspective, it's impossible, it's not lore-friendly, it doesn't make sense. And it's never happened before. And not because people didn't have like the ability to, but because it was physically impossible the moment Chaos came into the world. Chaos is the only race that was actually capable of conquering the entire world. And by conquering it, I mean destroying it. So, um, I just rambled for a super long time. I was trying to make this video like maybe 20 minutes, and now it's about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I hope you guys don't hate me. <laughs> I know that this is a sensitive subject, and that I'm probably going to get a lot of dislikes on this video. But I'm not going to back down from my opinions ever to try and make you guys happy. I love you guys. I love you guys. And because I love you, I will be honest with you. And I honestly think that this is a great decision. Now, if we want to talk about bad decisions, we can make a whole video about that. I love CA, but there's, there's a couple things. <clears throat> Vampire Counts Relate Release. <clears throat> um, but I love CA. I love what they're doing. I think this game is going to be amazing. I think it's going to be amazing. And CA, I don't know why you would watch my videos, but if you do, please keep up the great work. Don't listen to the haters. Keep going through. I think you have some wonderful ideas, and I think it will pan out. Please release Vampire Count Info soon. I'm dying for something. Um, I think that pretty much does it for me, guys. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you hate me now, okay. <laughs> um, feel free to type what you think in the comment section below. Let's try and keep it civil. Don't cuss each other out or anything i don't like that um you guys are you guys are very kind to me and i would like you to also be very kind to one another and keep the environment good so that pretty much uh wraps up this video we'll be talking some more about rosters and some other stuff uh later on this week um i hope you guys found this interesting educational insightful or maybe it helped you get your rage for the day um yeah that pretty much does it i uh, hope you guys have a great night bye